Hello everyone and welcome. It is Richard here at Kelvin Wazoo with another video for you. And this is another installment in Frank Zappa, one album at a time. And we are up to Joe's Garage. So yes, here we go with, um, Oh, I've lost count. <laughs> what the, you know what the official number is for these? Um, so just some little background on Joe's Garage Act One. It was there's Joe's Garage Act One, Act Two, and Act Three. And while it was packaged, I believe later to you know like a little mini box set or something like that. Um, the different acts were released individually in two installments. Act one was released in September of 1979. Act two and three, the uh, double album set, was November of 1979. So we've got Joe's Garage, Act one, okay, which was a single record uh, with the gatefold and a nice little insert in here. Um, and then the double record set a couple months later with X2 and 3. Okay, and uh, this one is a, got yeah, stamped here. It's a, it's a promo, promo copy that was shipped out and then got stamped. So um, it's not a white label you know, promo, as you can see. So, you know, what they did is the white label promos, you know, they would send out, you know, the various record companies. Um, but, you know, sometimes they ran out of them. So they would take a regular issue and then stamp it that way that it was a promo copy uh, when it was not a white label. You know, the, uh, you know, uh, the s sleeves, have you know the lyrics etc and, and the liner notes which were like in the little mini booklet in the uh, release for act one and uh the 2012 cd uh which was remastered from the original 1979 analog tapes now this one actually is a uh, 1987, these two are the Ryko disc releases, okay? So they were released in these, these two uh, individual sets, similar to uh, the LP version. So you've got, uh, this one is uh, disc one, okay? And then this one is disc two, which has parts two and three. Okay, so, uh, um, and and then you can see, you know, even though they talk about the 2012 CD being remastered from the original analog, you can see on these Ryko discs, you know, right there it says AAD, which means that it was analog original, analog mastered, and then digitally uh, recorded or pressed or whatever. Um, there are six guitar solos, uh, in this, I guess you could call it an opera, all right, because Joe's Garage does have a story, storyline and theme, you know, going all the way through it. So there are six guitar solos, and they're, uh, in the songs, On the Bus, Keep It Greasy, Outside Now. He used to cut the grass, and then Packard Goose, and then finally Watermelon in Easter Hay. Now, Denny Wally plays a uh, slide guitar solo in the song Crew Slut. And then all the other guitar parts, or nearly all of them, are performed or played by Warren Cucurullo. Um, Ike Willis, okay, was, was part of all this, this project. He played the rhythm guitar during the tour when they were touring 
uh, at this time, but um, on the album, he's only credited with vocals, not with any of the guitar work. And so the interesting thing about Joe's Garage, I find the most interesting, was there was no Joe's Garage in terms of a concept, in terms of these three albums, the, the entire story, okay? When Frank went to the Village Recorders in Los Angeles uh, in April of 79 to record a single, okay? And the, that single was going to be uh, Joe's Garage, the titular song, um, on side A, and then side B was going to be Catholic Girls, and that was that was it. But Frank said that uh, we just got into it, and the next thing we knew, we had all these other tracks laid down. So this was a project that really almost uh, spontaneously came into being when he went into uh, the recording studio in April of 1979. So they recorded all these other tracks and then Frank noticed that, well, there's this continuity in, within a storyline and that led him to develop the character, the central scrutinizer uh, who narrates um, the story in Joe's Garage and as well as the dialogue that's in the uh, track known as Cyborg. Uh, cyborg being S-Y-B-O-R-G. And so from this, the concept of Joe's Garage uh, developed. And on that concept, Frank said, well, the more people are the same, the easier it is for governments, businesses, and so on to control them, all right? So the premise of Joe's Garage is total criminalization, all right? Because if everyone is a criminal, then everyone is the same. And that's what governments want. That's what corporations want. They don't like individuality. And the problem with this though is not everyone wants to be a criminal. So how do you criminalize an entire society. Well, you do that by noting, hey, everybody likes music. So what do you do? You make music illegal and therefore everyone's a criminal. Now, the uh, central scrutinizer is then created as the agent to proselytize that music is bad for you, that it leads to all kinds of self-destructive behaviors um, and it's constructed in the same way that you know your person of my era maybe they still do it you know when they have these drug agents come into schools and they talk to the kids in the school about you know drugs are bad you shouldn't do drugs don't do drugs you know that's kind of what the central scrutinizers role becomes it, it, very much like that to go you know tell people that hey Music is bad, it's going to make you depraved, uh, don't listen to music. And in the libretto, um, where he's talking about it in Joe's Garage Act 1, you know, he's got all this information about the whole premise of Joe's Garage. Um, he brings in a little bit of uh, reality to this... Uh, uh, absurd premise in the storyline. And he says um, in there, and I quote from this, if the plot of the story seems just a little bit preposterous, and if the idea of the central scrutinizer enforcing laws that haven't been passed yet makes you giggle, just be glad you don't live in one of the cheerful little countries where at this very moment, Music is either severely restricted or, as it is in Iran, totally illegal. So 
yeah, all right. This was 1979, and this was right after um, the Islamic Revolution in Iran, where music was banned on television and radio. All right, so, um, you know, wow, there's, uh, <laughs> I just lost a bunch of sunlight, you know, for my lighting, but, you know, it's kind of a, you know, uh, music is illegal, so maybe this will add to the mood, perhaps. Anyway, uh, most of Acts 1 and 2 were also incorporated into chapters 3 and 4 of the Them or Us, the book. All right, um, and Them or Us is a release that I'll, I'll get to eventually. And then the working title initially was Arrogant Mop. All right, so that working title, that was in, in the idea when they went and did the uh, cover shoots. Uh, all right, so you've got the cover photo, which was by Norman Seif, uh, S-E-E-F, which sounds Dutch to me. Um, and then this uh, cover here for Acts 2 and 3. So you've got Frank holding this mop with grease all over his face. Um, the cover always made me cringe because it struck me as blackface. Um, you know, others have said, ah, oh, man, you know, it's just, it's Joe's garage. This is grease on his face. Well, yeah, um, you know, if you work in a garage, you, you know, you get grease all over you, not just on your face. And it's, but it's not, you know, it's like in blotches and streaks. It's not like covering your entire face. And, you know, I just, the way that it's put on, you know, it's not put on like he's greasy and dirty because he's a janitor or he's an auto mechanic you know, working in a garage. So yeah, it, it makes me cringe a little bit um, because, uh, you know, and Frank, you know, certainly um, ha had his own hubris to, you know, in terms of he can do whatever he wants with impunity. But anyway, that's my take on the cover. All right, I mean, I don't find them, um, I don't find it quite as blatant as the black face that you end up um, seeing with you are what you is. Um, so Joe Garage also kind of marks a point for me when Frank's hubris really begins to dominate his creative energy and releases from here on out. Uh, in my opinion, they become spotty. They're just not as cohesive as everything up to Joe's Garage. And sometimes they even start taking on a really bitter tone, um, especially, you know, when he starts injecting his experience with the record companies um, into his material. Um, so, yeah, this Joe's Garage, for me is marking pretty much uh, the top of his game, you know? And while I do not rank this album in my top 20, it could be like number 20 because my number 20th, I did a uh, number 20 I did in a video earlier. Um, I had um, The Man from Utopia as number 20 and I could easily swap Joe's Garage in there for number 20. Um, you know, so I do consider it among his better releases. I, there's just some songs on here that I really think are, you know, they're unnecessary. So, all right, we'll get started here and, um, I'll go through, you know, song by song, like I usually do with these videos, but I'm going to be really going over very superficially with a lot of them because, you know, there's three records here to get through. So we got Act 1, and it's opening up with the central scrutinizer, which is Frank narrating the story and, you know, and providing that that line of continuity that goes through the entire album. And the way he's getting that voice is um, he was speaking through a you know, megaphone. And then we open up with the uh, titular song, Joe's Garage. 
uh, which was released as a single in October 1979. Now, the B-side of uh, Joe's Garage in the U.S. ended up being uh, a piece called the Central Scrutinizer. So you know, by then, you see, he's, he had the um, concept. The concept was already, you know, being worked out because, remember, it was in April when all these tracks were laid down, and that's how, and the idea sort of gelled from there. Now, with the single, though, the B-side in Europe and Australia was Catholic Girls. So you know, those were the two songs that he had already prepared going into the studio without any concept of this entire piece or this, this set, uh, you know, for Joe's Garage. And the concept largely developed while they were on tour, while the band he was touring with in 1979. Um, and, you know, Frank was a person who always picked up on what, you know, the people he worked with, the musicians, recording engineers, etc., cetera, uh, were talking about. And, you know, he recorded people all the time. And a lot of his material, you know, the ideas came from that. So this idea developed because, uh, and then Joe's Garage, the song developed. That's primarily, you know, how the song developed because of, you know, members of the band during the 79 tour uh, talking about, uh, 78, 79 tour, talking about their own experiences with garage bands. And so that is how the song Joe's Garage developed and then which later then became developed more so into the entire three album set. Now there's a reference in Joe's Garage to uh, Jeff Holly plays tenor saxophone. And the story is, you know, Ike Willis and Jeff Holly met at college. And Holly was like a super fan, a fanatic of uh, Frank Zappa. And they became buddies, uh, Jeff and Ike Willis. And Jeff taught Ike Willis, Ike Willis, a guitar player, um, all of, you know, Frank's, uh, everything that he knew about Frank Zappa and Frank Zappa's playing. So um, when uh, Frank then and his band came to perform at their college, which I believe was Washington, um, Washington University. Um, Willis was working on like the stage crew and met Frank and they got to talking and Frank wanted to know, you know, he, he called him into his dressing room. He says, can you play guitar? Can you play my stuff? Uh, play some for me. And so Ike did. And because of, Jeff Holly's influence in getting him to learn Frank's material. And so he had this opportunity, you know, and Frank said, hey, yeah, come play with us. And Willis begged for Frank, you know, told him about Holly and Holly's influence on Willis's knowledge of Frank's catalog, you know, begged him, can you please, please, you know, we, can we make him part of this somehow? And so when they went to recording, um, you know, Joe's Garage, there is that line in there um, that says, you know, that the, that the tune was so simple, du, 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 you know, that even if you played it on saxophone, that was the reference to Jeff Holly, who in fact plays saxophone on the titular track, Joe's Garage. So, Ike Willis got his, you know, his wish to play with Frank Zappa, and he also got Frank to uh, do this for his friend, who, if it weren't for Jeff Holly, he would not have learned Frank's material. All right, so the next song is Crew Slut, and this began, you know, as a B-side single, and there's some crazy harmonica. I mean, the, the, the song is, uh, is got a really good groove to it, all right, and... Um, the uh, the harmonica there's this crazy harmonica on here by this guy named Craig Stewart who Zappa described as sounding like Coltrane on a harmonica uh, Zappa said and I mean fast like you won't believe this guy is like the El Dimiola of harmonica um, so Frank was really impressed with this guy but Stewart could not read music all right 
and he was unable to learn parts uh, just by picking up cues from the other musicians. So this was, Frank observed this when he auditioned Stewart for the Roxy and Elsewhere tour. This is when this was going on. So um, Frank was like, all right, this, this guy isn't going to work out no matter how crazy skilled he is at playing the harp. So he said, uh, Frank said, I told him to go back home and develop his ear to the point where somebody could say, it goes like this, and he could hear it and then play it. So after uh, dismissing Stewart, five years later, Stewart calls up Frank and says, hey, I can do it now. And so um, you've got Stewart uh, not just appearing on the, this song, uh, Crew Slut, but he's also on Harder Than Your Husband, which is on You Are What You Is. And he also is playing harmonica on uh, Cocaine Decisions on The Man From Utopia. Now with this song, Crew Slut, also, they went through endless, endless takes to finally get something uh, recorded that Frank was satisfied with. Um, because he kept telling the band, you're not, you're not grooving right, you're not grooving right. And um, so they went through all these takes that seemed like it would never end. And then finally, Frank was satisfied. And then that's, you know, what you hear. Because part of what was going on, um, there's that dialogue that's going on with uh, the girl in there. Um, also, it, that happens in, <clears throat> excuse me, the wet t-shirt contest. Uh, song, um, they had to go through all this vamping, you know, because that that was overdubbed later uh, and added to it uh, later. By the way, the reference to the Telefunken U47 um, is an actual mi uh, microphone that uh, uh, was very expensive, but it was also very popular in recording sc uh, studios at the time. I don't know, it might be. Uh, it is also known for being shaped like a penis. And then we go into Fembot in a Wet T-Shirt. So that's the actual title of the song, all right, despite many variations of the song title that appear. So, for example, on here, um, it's called Wet T-Shirt Night, all right? That's how it's titled here. And then, um, okay, where did I put my uh, vinyl copy? Here it is. On the label, it is called, um, let's see, side B, it's also called Wet T-Shirt Night, um, you know, on the vinyl release. And then when we get to the CD and this Ryko disc release, we see that it is called Fembot in a Wet T-Shirt. And then on the CD itself, um, this is disc, this is disc two, so it's on disc one. Uh, on disc one, it is called Fembot in a Wet T-shirt. So we get the original title here on the on the CD release, uh, but then it gets shortened to you know Wet T-shirt night or wet t-shirt uh what was it wet t-shirt night yeah um on the vinyl release so that some people were thinking because of the way it showed up on the vinyl release that it was it was a renaming that happened with the cd release and no that was the original title all, all along found in the wet t-shirt um the whole concept again of this came up because the band, uh, while they were touring in 1978, they were uh, on a layover in Miami before they were leaving the States and heading over for the European segment of the tour. And so Frank is out cruising around Miami, you know, in his limo, and he sees this sign at a bar that says, wet t-shirt night. So he went in and checked it out to conduct, conduct his, you know, his own anthropological study, uh, which was ultimately documented in this song. Um, we, then we go into On the Bus, uh, which is 
the CD title, all right? So on the CD, it's going to be identified as on the bus. And this is when we get the first of Frank's guitar solos. Just really, really sweet, incredible guitar solo. Now on the LP version, the song is called Toad O-Line, all right? So you get that, that in a minute here. The solo, all right, comes from uh, Frank soloing Inca Rhodes during a performance that was recorded in Eppelheim, Germany in uh, March of 1979. So, you know, here we are all, you know, in April of 1979. So he's already got this solo that he wants to use in the recording. Now, five minutes and 30 seconds are edited out of that solo. Uh, for the uh, for the segment that was used in uh, the song Toad Align. Uh, the complete unedited solo uh, is released on One Shot Deal, uh, the release One Shot Deal, and it's titled Occam's Razor, just in case you want to uh, look that up. Now, the solo is built around a phrase from a Toto, T-O-T-O, -T -O, Toto song called hold the line, all right? And that, that phrase is repeated five times throughout the solo, all right? And so that's where um, the, uh, uh, the uh, other title for the song, Toad O-Line, reference to Toto, and hold the line. All right, so also what you got, wet t-shirt, you've got on the bus, and why does it hurt when I pee? These three th songs all in a row were all recorded in a one continuous take. And as I mentioned, you know, there's that spoken part with Frank and the contestant from the wet t-shirt night that hadn't been written yet. So Frank had the band do this continuous vamp during that section, all right? And then with the instructions that he'll give them a signal, and then that's when they're gonna uh, then switch and go into um, why does it hurt when I pee? So, you know, he hadn't even written that dialogue part yet, uh, but he, I guess, you know, he had to figure out how long he might need for it. And so he just had them doing this continuous, uh, you know, vamping over and over again, which some of the musicians found really monotonous and really you know, to keep that going and, and re retain rhythmic integrity, uh, you know, it, it really kind of, you know, wore them off, wore them out. So that spoken part was, you know, that was done later and then overdubbed uh, to, go, to go in there. So then we get into the song, Why Does It Hurt When I Pee? And then again, this is the concept of this came out of another experience, you know, with the band, you know, while on tour. It was conceived on the bus as they were heading to a show. So you've got road manager Phil Kaufman who is taking a piss on the bus. And so as a joke, while he's in the restroom on the bus, he starts screaming while he's pissing. All right. And so and then when he comes out, he goes over to Frank and says, Frank, why does it hurt when I pee? You know, and everyone laughed and all that. Well, at that moment, Frank started writing a song. He scored the song, uh, and then he eventually handed that out to everybody on the bus and said, you need to learn this because we're going to perform it. And they did, in fact, debut the song uh, two days later, all right, two days later in Malmo, Sweden. And needless to say, the band members were not happy with Kaufman. After that, they told him to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> so... Uh, again, the song is continuing this setup premise that music is bad and causes problems such as venereal disease and other sexual aberrations. Well, then we go into the song, Lucille Has Messed My Mind Up. Uh, this is a song that was first released by Jeff Simmons in 1970 on the album of the same name. Jeff Simmons having been a former uh, bass player with the Mothers of Invention. I talk about uh, how he ended up getting <clears throat> ousted from, <coughs> excuse me, ousted from the uh, taping of 200 Motels and how uh, 
Frank wrote in uh, that part about I'm stealing the towels or I'm stealing the room, um, you know, that was mocking Jeff Simmons uh, and his girlfriend at that time who was telling him, you're too good for this comedy group. You know, you can, you need to go out on your own, you know, and that's what he ended up you know, doing, leaving during the shooting of 200 Motels. That's another story that's in my video about that. Uh, and the song has a really kind of a smooth reggae beat and, and, you know, it's just got, uh, um, you know, singing about how Lucille, you know, uh, Joe was singing how Lucille has messed up his mind and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and that closes Act 1, and then you have the central scrutinizer coming in and asks the question, you know, whether it was Lucille who messed up Joe's mind or was it the music? All right, then we got Act 2 begins with a token of my extreme, which is a play on the phrase, the token of one's extreme. We also get uh, the introduction of the term appliantology, which is the combination of appliance and scientology. And this uh, creation of this word, appliantology, is credited to the recording engineer, uh, Joe Ciccarelli, or Cicerelli, um, depending on how, you know, sometimes the double, uh, the double C's in Italian are sometimes pronounced as S, maybe, or, uh, or maybe they are pronounced as a hard C. Anyway, it's also a reference to L, you know, they talk about L. Ron Hoover, okay, uh, who is sort of the, uh, you know, the guru of appliantology. Uh, that's satirizing L. Ron Hubbard, who is the founder of Scientology which was like, you know, uh, a cult that really did influence a lot of people in Hollywood and the music industry. Uh, then we go into the song Stick It Out, which is a song filled with musical quotes and references. All right, so it's sung in both German and English. Uh, uh, German is a language that uh, Frank really, really liked. Uh, he characterized it as a rock language, a language very suited to rock and roll because it had this bite to it. So some of these quotes that you can hear as you're listening to it are going to be coming from like the, the song, What Kind of Girl Do You Think We Are? Uh, you know, from the um, Fillmore era, you know, with Flo and Eddie. Also from Dancing Fool, uh, which is... Um, uh, Shake Your Booty and Latex Solar Beef, which also from the, you know, Flo and Eddie. The, and some of these were modified. The words were modified to reflect the Who's See Me, Feel Me, you know, from Tommy. So these get uh, also quoted in there. Um, there's an unverified, but it uh, appears to be a quote by uh, Johnny Guitar Watson's uh, 1959 release, The Bear, because of the Hoo hoo backing vocals that are that are going on. So that's what's going on with Stick It Out. And then we come into Cyborg, all right, S Y B O R G, you know, Cyborg being a part human, part machine, okay, uh, the six million dollar man concept, all right. So the voice for Cyborg that you hear is as, you know, the Cyborg speaking, you know, with its. Um, attachments for sexual pleasure uh, is a combination of Ed Mann and Warren Kukurulu's voice, all right? So the way this all came about, again, Frank getting ideas from members of the band, um, Mann was like doing a Dan Aykroyd conehead voice that Frank heard. And so he said to, to uh, Frank, or excuse me, to... Um, Ed Mann, uh, hey, I want you to teach Warren how to do this so you guys can do it together. And then he went off, uh, Frank went off to write a script. So, you know, Ed Mann is trying to teach Warren Kukurulu how to do this voice so that they could do it together. So you see, you can hear the doubling of the voice, you know, when, the, when Cyborg is speaking. So that's the two of them doing this this voice that also gets altered, uh, you know, uh, during the recording process. 
And then Frank writes the script while they're practicing and learning how to do this. And then, um, and then we get, you know, the final outcome. I want to read a passage uh, from the book on this, uh, from this, uh, you know, the big note. So uh, Ed Mann says, so, uh, all right, meanwhile, Frank Zappa wrote out the script for that section, and then we tracked it line by line as Frank recited the exact rhythm and phrasing that he wanted for each line. So very exacting on this. Um, so just another one of those situations where at 4 a.m. you find yourself being unexpectedly rehearsed by Frank, doing something that is so absurd that you are trying hard not to laugh because tape and clock are running. And Frank is standing there holding you to his usual high level of performance expectation, looking for you to do it right. Meanwhile, he is cracking up as he hears each line or flub, and every time Frank laughs, everyone laughs, because when Frank thinks it's funny, it's funny. So that's uh, all that, you know, came about. Then we go into the song, Don't Work For Yuda, okay? <laughs> Which is an homage to Frank's bodyguard, John Smothers, who apparently was noted, uh, to uh, because he wore false teeth um he mispronounced words all the time and was a running joke especially when they were touring in europe and and he was uh you know telling cab drivers where he wanted to go and he was barely understandable um i i, I do have an experience where i saw smothers only one time and that was in tucson a, a show at the old main at the university of arizona and it was either the 81 or 80 show. And uh, I went to, uh, went to both of the shows. And then the, one of them, um, he had an early show. And he had an early show and a late show both years. And I can't remember which year it was, but I went to both the early and the late show. But anyway, there, there's, uh, Frank is like playing this guitar solo. And Smothers walks out on stage and whispers into Frank's ear. And then Frank walks off the stage um, the rest of the band keeps playing, not quite sure what's going on. Nobody knew what was going on. Later, um, I learned that apparently um, someone took a gun from the tour bus and was in the audience with it and or something like that. Um, I can't remember what solo he was playing uh, at the time that happened or what night it was that happened and all the other details. Much of... For a long time, I had no idea what happened. It was it was much later that I had read about and heard about, you know, the situation with the gun from the bus or whatever. Um, so, hey, if anybody was at one of the, the 80 or 81 shows in Tucson at Old Main and you get some more information about that, I'd sure appreciate, you know, some information down in the Down Under. All right, then we come up to the song, Keep It Greasy. Uh, which is spelled G-R-E-A-S-E-Y, all right? And Frank has a solo in here and that is combined from two shows in Munich, Germany from March 31st. And the solo comes from that performance of City of Tiny Lights, which, you know, I've said before, that's a song that is completely structured for Frank to play a solo. Um, the interesting thing is that the song has parts in 1916, the time signature is 1916. And then there are uh, parts in which the time signature is 2116. And then Ike Willis throughout the entire song is singing in 4-4 all the way, despite these other you know time signature changes. So um, Arthur Barrow is explaining this time signature, you know, again, here in this book. All right, so the part in 2116 can be counted this way. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Okay, and each digit is a 16th note. Then the part in 1916 is counted one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. Okay. 
Yeah. All right. So, and Keep It Greasy was definitely a popular song uh, in a lot of concerts. It's played, it was played, you know, for a long time in almost every show uh, that uh, Frank was, you know, putting on in the, in the following years. Then we get um, the song Outside Now. You know, Joe is released from prison. He's been sent to prison, you know, because he, you know, plays music and he got involved with a with cyborg. So he was having um, sexual encounters with a robot, you know. So he was music. You see, did that? It turned him into this sexually depraved person. He ends up going to prison. Um, so outside now has another Frank solo, and the source material is coming from. Um, that same solo in Munich, Germany, all right? So from City of Tiny Lights, but different parts of that solo. And that's what closes Act Two. Now, actually, the, through here, there's a series, the next, you know, several songs in a row all have really, really amazing guitar solos by Frank. So we come to the song, He Used to Cut the Grass. This has a guitar solo that's taken from a March 23rd show that was in Graz, Austria. All right. Again, really, really sublime guitar solo. And then the guitar solo, again, another really, truly amazing guitar solo in Packard Goose. All right. So this guitar solo, the provenance is a little iffy. Um, it's probably sourced from... Um, uh, when they played Easy Meat in Zurich on April 1st. Uh, so that part um, was um, uh, uh, using a Gibson SG. Um, and then the opening solo uh, then also was probably sourced from the opening solo uh, at the Late Show in Wiesbaden, Germany, from March 27th, in which case Frank is playing a Les Paul. Um, the, um, or excuse me there. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then we come to, uh, Watermelon and Easter Hay. And this is considered one of Frank's signature guitar solos, so much so that the Zappa family, um, identified it as a solo that they didn't want anybody performing or recording. All right. Um, of the solos, this is, this is one that was recorded in the studio, all right? This was not sourced from uh, a uh, live performance elsewhere and then overdubbed into, you know, the basic tracks. This was recorded in the studio. And the first and third parts, there's, there's three parts to the solo. And you can hear with from the first part to the second part a distinct change in sound and timbre because Frank is changing instruments. So the first and third part of the solo is done on a uh, Stratocaster that's plugged directly into the soundboard. All right. And then the middle solo part is on a Les Paul um, that goes through a boogie amp. And the complete title of the song Frank noted is playing a guitar solo with this band is like trying to grow a watermelon in Easter hay. Um, and at that time, Frank was noting that it was only recently, within the last few years, that he had this band that had a rhythm section that wouldn't get in his way while he was soloing, particularly during, you know, live shows, because the important thing is everybody has to be able to hear what everybody else is doing, particularly what Frank is doing, and then not get in the way when he's, you know, doing his solo. So, um, you know, it wasn't until the, this time in the, the, the middle to late 70s that Frank had a rhythm section that wouldn't get in his way while he was uh, soloing. Well, then, you know, uh, again, the, 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 the string of guitar solos is just absolutely amazing. Then we get to the final track um, on the uh, 
three record set, a little green Rosetta, which strikes me as a bit superfluous. Um, it just even kind of seems out of place. There are parts of it that are just, you know, in some respects, I guess it's, it's almost like, you know, the closing of um, Absolutely Free with the track America Drinks and Then Goes Home. You know, it's got, you know, a, a little bit of that kind of shtick to it. Um, I don't know. It just, as I said, it, it, it just seems kind of out of place. Um, so there you have it. Joe's Garage, part or Axe, one, two, and three. There you go with uh, this other installment of Frank Zappa, one album at a time. And as I have <clears throat> been doing, I am also adding a little segment here at the end about uh, book recommendations. So if you don't want to listen to the book recommendation, you can leave now. But the book recommendation, I got a couple books. Um, I picked these up uh, probably would have been in 2018, maybe 2019 because um, I was visiting a TV station in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, I do consulting work, I guess you could call it. Uh, I'm not my own contractor, but, you know, uh, I do work with TV stations and helping them with their web content for their news content. Anyway, um, you know, Central High School of Little Rock is there and very important historical site. And it is a national historic site. Um, so I went there to see the school and going through, you know, all the hist historical material that they have there at the visitor center, really, really amazing experience. And I picked up these two books that they had there written by who were then kids uh, of the Little Rock Nine. They were part of the Little Rock Nine that integrated um, Central High School in Little Rock. This one here, Lessons from Little Rock. This is by Terrence Roberts, all right, who was one of the Little Rock Nine. And then this one, uh, I Will Not Fear, My Story of a Lifetime of Building Faith Under Fire. This is by Melba Patillo Beals, who was also one of the students um, who uh, integrated, who played a role in integrating uh, Central High School. The amazing thing about this is I, I think like many people, I had this impression from the superficial coverage that we got in school about, how, you know, in history class, everybody talked about, you know, uh, you know, every, every curriculum talks about you know, the, the forced integration at uh, Central High School, but they make it sound like all the uproar and and the tension and everything was kind of like restricted to just a few days. And reading these books, it becomes clear it was not. It was the entire school year for these kids enduring. You know, they, they, these are kids, 14, 15 years old, enduring all kinds of just angry and virulent attacks against them that they had to have escorts taking them from class to class. But the escorts wouldn't go with them inside class. So they, they were still subject to all types of abuse um, by both their peers, their white classmates, and the teachers. Okay, and it so it was really eye opening to read this because um, these two, and then you know they talk also about their life afterward. Certainly, this this kind of experience, you know, is going to be huge on a person's life. And um, so the 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 post uh, Little Rock years are also covered in these books. But it really was, the, you know, I strongly recommend them because it really does reveal that this was not something that, you know, you may have the impression from your history class in school that this just took place over a, a matter of days. Um, this was for an entire school year. 
This was hell for these kids for an entire school year. And the fact that they stuck it out is just an incredible testament to their convictions um, and to their bravery. You know, my God, reading some of the things that they had to endure, and you're 14 years old, and this is what you're going through, and that this is what adults, adults are doing. It's just incredible reads. Very strongly recommend uh, those two books. And so there you have it, uh, Joe's Garage, a couple of books. And I hope you enjoyed that. Leave your comments in the down under. And remember that I am on Instagram as NewsDude76, N-E-W-Z-D-U-D-E-7-6. And as always, remember to pray for the people inside your head, for they won't be there when you're dead.